Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for somebody who spent about half their life in university teaching, this is an unusual experience because all of you are deeply knowledgeable and you have a great diversity of skill sets, so it's always a pleasure to lecture on this course. Now, what I'm going to do, the objective is to give you some idea about how vaccination alters the um, pattern of infection that you see. This pattern after an immunization program is introduced is often misinterpreted, and I'll point to some examples. And then I want to talk a little bit about the modern techniques of measurement of transmission and the impact of vaccination. Now, slides forward. I'm going to move quickly through the first bit, which is success, impact, evolution of the pathogen. I want to just say a little bit about evolution. Evolution is not in medical curricular teaching, which should be, uh, given the genetics and the importance of it. And then I'm going to spend most time on the epidemiological principles, and then at the end I'll end up with uh, how difficult it is to create herd immunity. First of all, we should always remind ourselves how successful. When medical historians look back on the past century, probably three things have really altered human life expectancy. One is certainly antibiotics. Another one is less understood, but looks probable, and that's statins and blood pressure control. But vaccination clearly is hugely important because it acts early in life and protects and gives you a lot of years of life gained. So here's two classic examples. The first one, of course, is old. That's measles immunization. And in most countries, post the 1960s and 70s, when these vaccines were introduced, the impact on measles is such that most young medical students don't see measles nowadays in, in Europe or, or many countries. And also um, on the right hand side, of course, is COVID. As messy and as difficult to understand as this situation is at the moment, what you can see in this data from the UK is certainly we had major transmission. The middle graph is cases recorded. The bottom graph is deaths. Now, the interpretation of the gain in terms of you've still got a lot of cases, but you've got much fewer deaths. That's complicated because there's been evolution and there's been other treatments like anti-inflammatories and so on. But a significant bit of that is due to immunization, there's no doubt. So just always remind ourselves how important vaccination is in the world. Now, vaccine uptake is never a given, and I'm so struck by this in the UK at the moment. We have for example, the lowest vaccine uptake in London that's been recorded um, for a very long time. We're getting down to 82% in London for measles. Uh, we're beginning to see little outbreaks in major cities. And so a situation which was very secure, where we got to coverage well above 90%, is now going backwards. Understanding this is a complex problem, and you'll get lectures about hesitancy. Um, but it's clearly multifactorial. There are many influences here, particularly as physicians have not necessarily seen these infections. Number one, number two, young parents haven't got the experience of what these infections can do. But those are just two of many reasons why there is vaccine hesitancy. And also the COVID immunization experience of multiple doses has had some effect on certain age groups. If we look at... Um, the global pattern of vaccine manufacture. This was the 2018-19 picture, most of it North America, Western Europe, and then, of course, India, the Indian Serum Institute, and a beginnings of an industry in China. Now, that pattern and the order of the companies involved in vaccine manufacturers changed very substantially due to COVID. So if we take the top six vaccine manufacturers as of April 2023, this is the current picture. And essentially, we've got some new, three new players there, very significantly, BioNTech, Xenovac and Moderna. And the others, Merck and GSK, who were at the top of the list are now down the bottom of the list because they didn't produce the COVID vaccine. So COVID has had a huge influence on the profitability of these vaccine manufacturing companies, enormous in one particular example. So it's worth remembering that COVID has had many influences, but this is one. Now, there are some, some, some beneficial aspects to this, which is the world's vaccine manufacturing capability. 
But just ask yourself, if we had an H5N1 human epidemic next week, what is our international, worldwide vaccine manufacturing capability for influenza A? It's far, far from what we'd actually need. Interesting conversation earlier today at breakfast about what the vaccine industry in the veterinary area could do here. And that's a very interesting question because they have a lot of vaccine manufacturing capability. Now, turning to the countries that dominated um, COVID vaccination, again, this pattern changed very substantially, with China becoming a very major player in providing vaccines for all different parts of the world. But it is, if you look at childhood vaccine uptake in 2016 on the right-hand side, and then you look at COVID vaccine uptake, it is a, a tragedy in some ways how little vaccine was distributed in, in Africa. It's still something that shocks when you see this sort of data. Now, I'm going to finish there on the COVID side and now turn to pathogens and evolution and epidemiology. One thing that's hugely important, which modern techniques give us deep insights into is molecular epidemiology, which is sequencing, the whole genome sequencing of a virus or a bacteria, or even a very big organism like the malaria parasite. This molecular epidemiology enables you to say of the virus that's transmitting in the world at the moment, how much variation is present. We have the very stable viruses, the relatively homogeneous genomes, which are the measles, mumps and rubella. And then we start to move through various areas where Genetic diversity increases all the time. Bordetella, pertussis is one, dengue, four major strains, sign of a possible fifth strain. And then we go through these multivalent vaccine areas. And of course, we've got a new one coming up, RSV, with Merck and GSK's product. And it'd be very interesting to see what that does when introduced in terms of the evolution of the RSV conglomerate of strains. Where does SARS lie? The co um, coronavirus 2, probably beyond the pneumococcal RSV and rotavirus domain diversity. And then, of course, HIV and malaria are in a class of their own. HIV, in an infected patient with a high viremia, you've got every mutation possible across the genome every day, which is staggering thought. And then if you take malaria, you've got three methods of generating genetic diversity. Um, if I throw a question to you, what are the three mechanisms? Must be mutation, must be sex, recombination. What's the third one? Very sophisticated method. Multiple copies of the same gene, which encode for a surface antigen. Each copy is slightly different. The parasite has the ability to turn on and off particular copies of that gene. So malaria is a real struggle because it's always going to be evolving ahead of you. So bear this in mind that the, we've been successful at the easy end of the spectrum. And those of you who've been involved in HIV will know we've been singularly unsuccessful in the more complicated end, the HIV end. COVID is a, another story. The evolution of this virus, which is being very carefully tracked in some countries, not all, but a few, it's just staggering. Um, and this evolution is continuing every day. And the more cases there are per unit of time, of course, the more the rate of evolution. I'll come back to this at a later stage, what this implies. This is the data from the Sanger Center's sequencing information on um, coronavirus 2. And you can see the waves of the different variants going through. Now, the reason I put this in is I wanted to ask you a question. What drives the evolution of the coronavirus and what is natural selection trying to do? Let's take the last one first. Yes, now what is the parameter that survival is best reflected by? Yes, it is. It's reproduction and transmission of a virus is the number of secondary cases you generate from one primary case. So evolution drives to maximize this quantity R0, which is the reproductive number, the average number of secondary cases generated by one primary case. But here's the question, the really important question. Does maximizing R, which is absolutely going on there, what was the R0 of alpha? Two to three. What's the R0 of B5? Seven, eight, nine. 
So its natural selection is absolutely reflected in this story. But here's the important question. Is maximizing R0 equivalent to minimizing pathogenicity? Correct. It's no. Just so stories are the ones which say it minimizes. Now, in another literature, not often read by infectious disease or medical people, which is the evolutionary biology literature, there's many, many detailed studies showing that evolution drives to maximize R0, but that also can be associated with an increase in pathogenicity. And we've got to be very, very careful here because it means in the monitoring of this virus, we've got to look very carefully at when you do have serious infections, what strain is present and what are the consequences for that individual patient. So never take it as given that evolution is to drive to reduce pathogenicity. Every pediatric infectious disease textbook has this wrong. Yeah, it's very interesting. They always comment that evolution drives to be less pathogenic. The argument is false simply because the pathogen is trying to maximize R0. If by killing your host quickly, you have much, much higher viremia and more infectious, that's beneficial to the pathogen. And the best practical example of that is the myxoma virus, which was a, a rabbit virus, a veterinary example. So keep that in mind, the evolutionary consequences. Now, with the evolution, of course, um, if you take the coronavirus before the recent one, this is excellent data coming out of a recent publication in Science, but the data comes from a, a more detailed longitudinal study in Kenya uh, near Kalifi, and it shows the alpha and beta coronaviruses, and it shows serology and recent infection through the IgG and IgM classes. And you can see with these old coronaviruses, everybody got them young, and then they were seropositive, and then the incidence of real disease and new infections was very low in the adults. So this, of course, raises the question of what the future is for SARS-CoV-2. Um, is it ideal to have a lot of exposure when you're young? And that relates to all sorts of other clinical questions, like what is the incidence of long COVID or severe consequences in the young from having COVID? Okay. Now, if we just think about our own evolution, um, we're actually a much more recent species on the Earth than many people realize. So Homo sapiens is um, quite a few decayed, uh, tens of thousands of years old, but it's not much more than that. So the issue is that we're always going to face spiral evolution at a time scale that's infinitely faster than human evolution. So in this time scale of human evolution of Homo sapiens, there have been trillions of generations of influenza A while the number of generations of humans in that time is a few tens of thousands. So always the evolution of these pathogens is going to be well ahead. Now, modern medicine, you hope, is going to catch up. It's going to sort of enable us to be nimble and swift on the feet. But that is an assumption. So always bear these two evolutionary time frames. Now, there's a link question here. How important have infectious diseases been in human evolution over time? That's a question you can pose retrospectively by whole genome sequencing. What is the most variable bit of the human genome? Any guesses? HLA? The IR genes? So the bits that are coding for the human immune system and the recognition of non-self is the most variable bit. What does that say in evolutionary terms? Infectious diseases have been hugely important in our evolution. It's been a strong selective pressure in our past. Now, there are three, four things that are important in the modern world. First of all, population size is growing. We're aiming to nine billion. Two reasons that's important. One, more dense populations, higher transmission rates. Number two, every transmission rate event is an opportunity for evolution. So population density marches in hand with speeding up viral evolution. So bear those two things in mind. The second is reflected in this slide from geography. These are people's lifetime prints. Take the grand, great grandfather, this is from the UK. He wandered between towns, probably walked or went by horseback. His uh, son, the grandfather, went by horse or coach, and he wandered between localities in Britain. 
Then his generation was my father's generation. He was a Second World War generation, and some of that movement imprint reflects that. And then I'm the son here, but my children have an even worse imprint than I do. So I'm a global wanderer um, and have been for work reasons, and they are also. So in four generations of our species that's only had a few tens of thousands of generation, we've turned from local domestic to internationally moving. And that has huge consequences for transmission of infection. And here's a, a reflection of that. This database is accessible to scientists, but with difficulty. This is the passenger airplane movement database. It's held in Los Alamos in the States. And each dot is an airplane. You can get the actual number of people there. You can take the nodes, the airports, where people are going. You can look at mixing and moving of all these people. The best illustration of this importance was the 2009 H1N1 epidemic in Mexico, because you can just see how that spread worldwide through airlines and airports. And of course, COVID was exactly the same. The last thing I want to mention is we're becoming, up to COVID, more living in cities with surrounding peri-urban areas. This is Hong Kong, where food and animals are brought in. And remember, humans have acquired virtually all their infections from wildlife and domestic animals, and we will continue to do so. H5N1 is a classic example at the moment. So remember this increased urbanization. This is only going up to 2015, but the trend has continued. Dominantly in Asia, creating big population centers, creates opportunities for interaction between livestock and humans, and that's transmission events. Now, back to the epidemiology just very quickly. First of all, most viral infections that create some degree of immunity are boom and bust. And these are examples of measles in the Faroe Islands, Copenhagen and uh, UK before mass immunization. Why are they boom and bust? Why do they go up and come down again? Those of you observant will have noticed there's two cycles in there. One seasonal. The other cycle on the UK is two years. What causes the boom and bust? Sorry? Yes, you're right. Um, it is acquired immunity causes the reproductive number to fall below unity the infection wanes until the birth rate replaces the supply of susceptibles. So it tells you something else. In London versus Lagos, Lagos with a birth rate twice that of London, then those cycles will be annual, not biannual. The longer the cycle, the lower the birth rate in that community, the rate of replacement of the susceptibles. So everything about herd immunity is reflected in the epidemiological patterns you see. Now, coronavirus 2, what's that going to look like? Seasonality we know about. It, that's given. What else is it going to look like? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be boom and bust? You're all being very shy and cautious here. <laughs> I don't think it is going to be boom and bust, actually. I think it's going to be endemic, seasonal. There will be explosions, which will be evolution of new strains with high R naught. There will be some contractions, and then we've got this horrible mess of herd immunity out there from infection and multiple vaccines, which we don't understand at all how important that is. And as somebody who's had five vaccines in two episodes of uh, COVID, um, <laughs> having had one quite recently after an airline flight, um, having sat next to somebody who was coughing very strongly throughout the flight, so I, I knew where the transmission event was. Um, clearly, immunity... Acquired immunity is very, very short-lived, and one's looking at time scales of about four, six months, something of that. Or protection against infection, I hasten to add. There are three things that are important here. Protection against infection, protection against serious disease, and protection against death, obviously. Now, moving very quickly, the basic reproductive number is the magic number that epidemiologists love. You know what it is. Um, it was measured very frequently, except in America, actually, I hasten to add. Um, uh, very frequently in many countries throughout the world, and its magnitude is determined by many parameters. Um, if you're a clinical person, then there's a lot of clinical epidemiology in this. There's measurements of duration of infectiousness and all sorts of things in viremia. So there's a denominator and a numerator, 
Um, the denominator contains all the rates of change, like duration of infectiousness. The numerator contains population density, transmission efficiency, and all sorts of things like that. And there are about 10 parameters involved in COVID-2 R0. Now, you can't measure all of them independently, but there are all sorts of software packages freely available, which enable you to estimate R off changes in instance over time. So that software has been widely used during the past uh, epidemic. Now, what does vaccination do? First of all, the reproductive number is not something that's uniform. There's a lot of stochasticity and chance in the spread of infection. The mathematics lying under this is the same as the mathematics, oddly enough, that's in nuclear physics about splitting atoms and bombarding a cascade. It's very odd. The mathematics is identical. And this sort of chain of stochastic events goes forward. Now, what immunization does is you take that pattern First of all, you have to interpret this, and this is always surprising, particularly to medical students. If you said to them that an epidemic curve is dominated by only two parameters, they would tell you rubbish, as all human behaviour and all the rest of it. But it's true. There are two parameters that dominate the shape of this. One is R0, and the second one is what is called the generation time. It's the average time for an infection to when somebody passes on to somebody else. Those two parameters dominate both the time scale of the bottom axis. If the generation time is fast, everything happens quickly, and that's influenza A. If it's slow, like HIV, then that peak is 100 years after the beginning. For SARS, you're about two years after the beginning of the peak, if nothing had happened in terms of vaccines. So those two parameters determine the exponential rise, the area under the curve, and all the rest of it. And mathematics plays a role there, as statistics does in estimation of the key parameters. When you start to vaccinate, you put sort of little green blobs in and stop these chains of transmission. And it becomes obvious very quickly that there will be a level of vaccine uptake that will take that number below unity in value. And then you think, well, how do I put all those bits and pieces together to work out what fraction of kids should I be successfully immunizing to stop transmission in the community? And that's doable, set with COVID for reasons I'll come to. First of all, the estimates of R0 vary greatly. So measles is a highly transmissible infection, has very big R0 values prior to immunization. Influenza is on the cusp of persisting or not persisting. Influenza A has an exceedingly low R0, and that's good news. The generation time is bad news, because when things happen, they happen quickly. Then if we look at SARS, we've got this huge variance, uh, depending on genetic strain of the, the organism. Now, clinical epidemiology is, is not a very popular topic, but it should be more importantly, given the modern techniques for measuring viremia. So with quantitative PCR now, your only problem is persuading a patient to come in every two hours and have some horrible procedure done so that you can measure viremia. At Imperial College, we managed very con controversial medical student volunteers to persuade a significant sample to be infected with COVID during the early stages. Um, it was very, very controversial amongst staff. But that gave exceedingly good viremia incubation infectious period data. With influenza A, you're probably aware of this sort of data, which underlay the clinical trials for Tamiflu and Relenza, the two anti-influenza A drugs. And this is the COVID-2, this is the alpha variant. And immediately, if you look at these two, if you look at the time axis on the bottom, days post-viral inoculation, and then you look at these, Look how long the period of infectiousness is. It's huge. So that is part of our naught, that duration of infectiousness. And it's reason why the Omicron variants are so highly transmissible. They're not short-lived. Those of you who have persistently done your home kit PCR post-turning positive will know that eight, nine, ten days post-first positive test is not exceptional. So there's virus about a lot of the time. Well, what is herd immunity? Herd immunity is the fraction of immunity in the community, um, its impact on the rate of transmission, and we need to calculate what level we need to create to stop R0. And very quickly, 
One way of doing this for the long-lived immunity is to construct an age-specific serological profile, maternal antibody decay in green, usually with viruses half-life of six months, and then red is rise of antibody from infection. And what your objective is to block the black area with immunization to take R0 below one. How do you do that? It's easy for influenza. Who would guess if you got the correct vaccine for a strain that's circulating, what level of uptake of vaccination would you have to have to stop an influenza A epidemic? Anybody have a guess? Lower. 30. 30, 37. Right, I'm going to rush because uh, quite correctly. Let me just quickly go on to, first of all, r naught is not a uniform number with a smicked average. This is the first sars cov epidemic when I was in Hong Kong. And this is the Amoy Gardens case. So one person was responsible for a very large transmission set of events. So it's not a uniform average. It's very variable between people. Um, and vaccine efficacy matters hugely in these calculations. And I just say I cannot comment sensibly on COVID-2 yet uh, for obvious reasons. But these are the calculations that you need to do. So with a long-lived immunity vaccine, this calculation works very well. Eta is vaccine efficacy from 0 to 1. Now, if the immunity is very, very short-lived, like four to six months, what do you think the calculation of P gives you? Everybody's got to be vaccinated every year, basically. So it's not something where herd immunity created by mass vaccination is really going to work to eradicate the infection. Now, I'm going to just end on, this is that point, with an R0 of 5 and an ETA of 0.8. That's 80% effectiveness in ter terminating infectiousness. You have to vaccinate 100% of the community. Now, let me just end on the other bits that vaccination does to people and communities. When you start immunizing, you reduce R0 and you immediately increase the average age of infection. Now, with the measles vaccine introduced in the 60s, in America, there was great concern at one stage that college students were turning up with measles, and it was interpreted as a failure of vaccine to provide infection. Wrong. What it was, was shifting the average age of infection due to very good vaccine uptake. So bear that in mind. If you've got a long duration of protection vaccine, it's going to shift the average age of infection. Um, Here's an example. This is measles, actually, and it just shows you the average age of infection shifted in terms of the proportion of the cohort immunized. So it's really quite dramatic. You're shifting the average age up into adult age classes. And you can do this in a very sophisticated way with uh, mathematics nowadays. You can look at how an immunization program will influence the herd immunity profile. This was done for rubella. Um, the wonderful data on rubella is from Finland. And essentially, what happens when you start immunizing, you reduce R0, the cohort that just missed immunization gets less infected. And therefore, you have a ripple of susceptibility that moves across. And data from Finland from the national surveys, serological surveys, shows this precisely. So what you've got to do in the immunization program is fill that hole. Now, just to end... Um, Epidemiology is an increasingly multidisciplinary subject. It involves molecular genetics. Importantly, it involves clinical epidemiology. It involves a lot of mathematics and a lot of statistics. And I just want to give you a reflection on the power of these computational tools now. This example is taking the world, taking the airline movement data, having influenza A, H5N1 emerge in Cambodia. How long would it take for that to spread worldwide? if this works. Yes, it does. So this is the world's population being simulated in a few seconds. This took a lot longer than that to compute. And this is using current airline airport connection data and population density data. So no place in the world is safe with these pandemics today. Um, I looked at UK quite carefully because being a Scotsman, I looked at the islands off the West Coast. There's some good examples up there, but Telling people that that's a good place to go to is not a sensible idea. Uh, now, just to end, finally, I'm going to go to 
the conclusion. I'm going to skip this bit, but it's in the course. If vaccine supply is, and I want to leave this question in your mind because it's a very delicate one, which involves a lot of ethics. So if vaccine supply is limited, what should the design of your vaccination program be? Is it to minimize short-term mortality because you don't want to saturate the hospitals? Is it to maximize the number of healthy years of life gained? Um, or is it some combination? Which one of these you choose, you would do different things. Supposing I'm a tough nut and I go for maximizing the number of healthy years life saved. In Africa, who would I vaccinate first? Sorry? Yeah. Who would I vaccinate first in a, a wealthy Western country? How elderly? I personal question. But, yeah. um, actually, it's younger than you would think. Because if you're optimizing years of healthy life, you don't go to the 90 year olds. You go to a bit younger than that. So these questions have many ethical considerations and, and principles, but they need addressing if in an emergency your vaccine supply is extremely limited. And what you must plot, of course, is an epidemiological plot of case fatality rates or case complication rate by age, gender, etc., etc. Now, conclusions, I'm going to whisk to the conclusions. If, uh... So eradication by vaccination is very difficult when all not large and when the life expectancy of the vaccine is very short. Heteroneity and density, I haven't touched on heteroneity, but if I take Africa and look at measles, particularly Kenya, and look at measles immunization uptake by village, I find staggering heteroneity. And that matters because you can have pockets of persistence and infection. Cities are more important for measles than villages. So city variation is much greater importance. And then just remember, this is a very interdisciplinary science area, and you need a lot of different skills in a team to bring them together to really do good epidemiological analysis and data collection. The multi-strain system for SARS is going to present us with many problems in the future. I have no doubt about that. And what's so depressing is the International Molecular Epidemiological Surveillance, already the funding is starting to be reduced very dramatically. So we're not clear already which direction evolution is going here. And that's a problem. Adam, I apologise. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, fascinating talk. And, and, you know, we were suddenly confronted with those kind of questions on JCVI, you know, what are we doing and why are we doing it? But a big bunch of politics thrown in, of course, at that yes. point. Mm. Um, right, so we have time for some questions. Um, and apart from the question of where to go when there's a pandemic, which <laughs> seems to be the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, <laughs> right, anyone with a finger? Yeah. Hi, uh, Anna Raukens from the Netherlands. Um, I have a question on monkeypox because uh, I don't know what happened in the UK, but in the Netherlands, the the, the number of new cases already declined yes. before the vaccination campaign started. So yeah. do you think the high-risk population has been immunized by natural infection? Or? No, it's behavior change. So uh, my own view, we have at the Samaris Hospital where I, I work, we have a very big STD clinic um, and associated with the publicity about monkeypox, there were a decline in other rates of infection. So I think I may be wrong, but I think there's a very substantial bit of behavior change there by individuals. Post HIV, HIV is not a curable infection, but it's a treatable infection. Um, there have been, in certain communities, there have been a relaxation of behavioral standards and that triggered the monkeypox outbreak. Monkeypox was never, despite what politicians said, was never going to be a pandemic of significance. There, there are a whole set of epidemiological characteristics that said this is going to be quite restricted in its spread. But it's very good that the vaccine works against that strain. I don't. I really don't. I, I think our major worry is the respiratory infections. I'm particularly concerned by H5N1. We've been tracking at Imperial the chains of transmission in humans for that um, and estimating the R-noughts. The R-noughts are getting close to one in some cases, and that's not good news. 
That's why I posed the question earlier about um, influenza A vaccine manufacturing capability that may become important. So relevant to monkeypox, people uh, old enough like me and probably Roy mm -hmm. to have been immunized against smallpox are gradually yeah. dying out. And that's, uh, <laughs> that was actually uh, a, an important factor, I think, in keeping monkeypox yeah. under control. It used to be one, the other certificate you had to carry with you when you travelled. You carried with your yellow fever vaccine and you carried your smallpox vaccination certificate. Right, who's next? Uh, yes, over there. And then over there. Thank you, uh, Pamela from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So with us, there's some kind of controversy, controversy pushing herd immunity mm -hmm. because many people who get vaccinated keep having COVID-19. Yes. So the population doesn't know if they should continue taking the vaccines because the cases are still coming up. So what is your take on that? Because does it, does it mean the vaccine is not as, if, as efficient as it's supposed to be or what exactly is happening? About, um, I'll comment on the herd immunity side first, but on advice about whether um, you should vaccinate or not against COVID, I'm going to duck that because I'm asked this by the family all the time, particularly with young children. And the answer strictly is that we don't know at, at present about the benefits of this multiple immunization. I think if you've got vulnerable people um, who have other associated conditions, whether it's severe asthma or whatever, then the, the sensible thing is to be immunized. If it's a younger population, it's a much more open question. And I know in Cameroon, your age specific demography is such that, you know, probably 40% of your population are very young. And so we hope the coronavirus I showed from Kenya, from Kalifi, it's a very interesting example, the IgG positivity. It just shows that all those kids get infected very young. And then after that, they're pretty immune to this whole spe Both the alpha and beta coronaviruses have multiple strains. And those two viruses are still evolving. And so, you know, what's in one's mind, and Adam will have obviously wrestled with this on the vaccination committees, that essentially your, your question is whether you try and encourage spread at a younger age. Now, the answer clinically that why you shouldn't at the moment do that is related to Norman's comment about data is that we do not have good data on adverse consequences of infection with COVID-19 in the younger age groups. And I'm talking here from two, say to 15, something like that. We really don't have good quality data. And it, it makes another case that although our government's attentions on COVID have all vanished, um, or not all vanished, but they've lessened there is still a desperate need for high quality phase four studies in this messy immune environment, multiple different vaccines used, multiple different personal exposure experiences. So those phase four studies have got to be very sophisticated. And in an ideal world, you'd like, if there's an event, you know, elevated temperature, you'd like to look at which virus is present, um, which respiratory virus, so you'd want to go, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, RSV, influenza A, and COVID-2. Um, so that's not answering your question, but I'm ducking it. I would have thought, stick with the vulnerabilities bit. Yeah. Well, another point to throw in is that at the moment, the, the COVID vaccines we have seem to be singularly poor at inducing any kind of mucosal immune response apart from passive IgG whereas infection doesn't use IgA responses. So hmm. it may be that the vaccinations that we have right now have very limited capacity to, to interrupt transmission, as Roy was saying, whereas infection may do that. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, very tricky one to answer. Uh, it, one, one more very short question. Hmm. Yes, the lady at the back. Microphone. Sorry, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, I think the impact of vaccination... Name? Oh, sorry. Jen uh, from Singapore. Mm -hmm. So impact of the vaccination is really, um, um, so oh, let me, let me take a quick question. Um, impact of vaccination on EPI is really closely related to the public program and educational program. So, um, would you be able to share some good example from your experience or maybe from seeing from the other government? to educate the public how to really share the impact of vaccination. And for example, like COVID situation would be a perfect timing to really capture a good example. 
Well, it's a very, very good and important question, and it applies to all countries. We are attempting to put together a meta-analysis of some countries have done very good studies. Israel is one example, and South Africa actually has done some very good studies of the exact history of people's vaccination, which vaccine they've had, whether they've had a fever event, often it's not diagnosed beyond that, and to look at the association over time. But it's a seemingly complex thing to do. You've got age, gender, other health conditions. And as I said earlier, what we should be focusing on is persuading our governments to put in place these long-term studies, essentially. Now, the other issue about vaccine hesitancy, um, it's a it's a terrible dilemma because it's one of these problems where your response to a question, say, um, children asking whether they should immunize their children, grand, my grandchildren. Um, the issue is if the disease is rare, uh, you need to do a calculation, which is getting the infection, case complication rate from getting it, having the vaccine, case complication rate from the vaccine. Now, when the disease is common, it's always in one direction. It's always best to have your child immunized. When the infection becomes very rare, that probability inevitably reverses. So your optimum strategy as a parent is to persuade everybody else to vaccinate their children and you not vaccinate them. But I mean, you can't wish this dilemma away. It's true. There, you, as in the United States in 1968 to 72, immunization was made a legal um, responsibility for parents to take their children to school. We had the same argument in Britain at the time, and our beloved government at the time rejected that option. So parents didn't have to have their children in Manez to go to children to school. So I think it, all of us have to have a personal responsibility about vaccination. We know it's the one of the three top medical interventions in the past century of medicine, and therefore we we just constantly got to say how important it is. I'm going to do something terrible, Adam. There's a young lady here who had her hand up right from the beginning. And could go I for possibly... It. Go for it. Go for yes. it. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Mm. Like, it's a very informative presentation and many thank you for this. Mm. Uh, uh, your presentation had a lot of a uh, lot of experiences uh, on measles. Mm. India is uh, its own way of measles elimination. Yes. And we have a goal of 2026. So what are the key lessons that you have, that you can see that, we can replicate in India to fast track that. Focus on the cities. Uh, there will be a, an attempt to focus on the, the poorer, smaller villages in the rural communities. The main transmission sites for measles. It is a big, big population infection. So what you've got to do is identify the marginalised slum communities in those villages and make sure that they get the educational material which persuades mothers to take their children to be vaccinated. Because if it does persist in India, which is a high probability, I, I'm sorry to say, um, it, it will, you know, 2026 is great to have that ambition, but you, you're going to be tough getting there. But concentrate on the marginalised poor communities in big cities.